are uh, listed on the uh, standard list of the London Stock Exchange, but what's slightly unusual is that we've been funded by three major shareholders. So to date, we've had uh, over 70 million invested from a sovereign wealth fund, from m and who you know here in London, and even more unusually from, from the chairman, from myself. We have a market cap of less than 100 million pounds, and we're developing one of the world's largest rare earth projects. You might say, what's rare earths about? It's um, pretty simple, really. If we're going to have an energy transition, we need electric vehicles, we need offshore wind, they're going to need critical minerals, and the demand's enormous. Doesn't matter who you look at, in this case it's uh, IEA, we're talking about a 400% increase in demand for this material. Um, and the, the material itself is incredibly important. We, we take it for granted. So the rare earth market itself is tiny, like 8 billion, and it enables 3.2 trillion dollars worth of in industry. And we quite literally, everything we do in industrial, medical, domestic, it's part of our everyday lives, these, these little permanent magnets. Um, but the big drivers going forward are going to be electric vehicles and offshore wind. If I can just talk about electric vehicles, Everyone talks about lithium-ion batteries. All a lithium-ion battery does is provide electricity. What makes an electric vehicle go? You remember from school, it's an um, electric motor, which is a magnet and a copper coil. And that's what the rare earths are. They go into those permanent magnets. So we're presenting Pensana to you now as a funded developing uh, opportunity for uh, UK investors. It's a massive thematic. It's really very, very big, big drivers. We own one of the biggest deposits on the planet, and I'll explain in a minute why we think we'll be one of the only ones to get into production. Um, we are global significant in terms of production. We'll be 5% of world production, and importantly, we've got a very low upfront capital cost, which we've funded. So normally these mines cost a lot of money, so we'll be able to do it cheaply. And as I mentioned, we're funded by our shareholders. Sovereign Wealth Fund, m and uh, et al. Just a little bit of geography. We're in a country called Angola. What makes the mine exceptional is we're sitting right next door to a $2 billion railway line that links to a $2 billion port, and we've got hydroelectric power. So normally mines are in the middle of nowhere with no infrastructure. This has got some of the best infrastructure on the planet, and we've got super high grades sitting at the surface. So this is a mine, but in fact, we only have to mine down 30 meters, and we're mining for very, very, these are very high grades, 4% TREO. Um, the geologists get carried away, and they've gone and found some more, just 75 kilometers north. Apparently, we've got another, another one of these they're just discovering. So lots of material there. We've already got a 20-year mine life. And then just in terms of Angola, um, hugely, hugely exciting place right now. Uh, we've got Rio Tinto, Ivanhoe, if you know this guy, Robert Friedland, uh, De Beers, raft of big companies moving in, and the US government is putting uh, a couple of billion dollars into development of the country. And the reason for it is, is all the copper previously was going to railway lines to the east. This railway line is a very rare railway line that goes to the west, to the Atlantic seaboard, and it's quite strategic. So, a lot of US money coming into the country. Um, our mine, as I mentioned, we've got this advantage is that we've got, because of all the infrastructure, our upfront capital cost is super low, $200 million, compared to our competitors that have much bigger numbers. Um, a part of it is because we've modularized it. Those of you who are in construction industry will know that you can manufacture complex bits of kit and process circuits somewhere else literally bring them in on site as a sort of IKEA flat pack, unpack it all and, and bolt it together. So the whole of our plant arrives on site, literally in containers, and we, uh, we bolt it together, on site assembly, and we've pilot tested it elsewhere. So that's one of the reasons why our capital cost is so low. Um, and we're underway. We are actually doing this now. So this is the Apparently, this is the foundations for the laundry for the 300-person 
350 person camp. Um, and this is all the drainage, the access roads, all of those are underway being done. And this is our construction schedule. So we're sitting here now in, uh, in March. We're just doing, as you see on there, top of the line, bulk earthworks. From May onwards, we're into construction. That is pouring concrete, steel work coming out of the ground. And we go into three phases of commissioning from uh, early next year through the most of next year. So we've really got a 12 month build to actually build this and actually start producing, producing product. The, the market we're targeting is the market that you know. So every electric, every car company on the planet is on some form of journey to electric vehicles. At the front of the pack is Tesla, who you know, and probably at the back of the pack is probably Honda. And each one's got different rates of development for electric vehicles. And what they're all looking for is they want mine to magnet transparency. They want to know that the mine is actually developing the, the rare earth permanent magnets without child labor, environmentally safe, etc. They want super low embedded carbon. Ultimately, cars are going to have carbon ratings on them, just like your fridge has got an energy rating, a car will have a carbon rating. And to do that, they've got to have the, the raw materials going to be sourced with ultra low carbon. We can do that because we're using offshore, we're using hydroelectric power in, to power our mine. A diversified supply. Currently, China absolutely dominates this sector. So anything that is non-Chinese for them is diversifying. And obviously, we have to compete on pricing. So we're working with, with these companies to be a supplier to these companies. We have ambitions to go downstream. So at the moment, everything I'm sharing with you today is what we call the upstream, which is just a mine. Going to produce a what's called a mixture of carbonate, which will get so sold to somewhere going downstream. What we want to do going forward is build a separation circuit in the UK at Salt End uh, Chemicals Park and then go at the Yorkshire Energy Park, go to metal. That's our ambition. And then we'll partner with, we hope to partner with a Japanese or European magnet manufacturer. So we are the resource upstream. This middle bit here, the midstream, that's what we want to do in the UK. And one of the reasons why I want to do it in the UK is we've got these advantages called chemical parks and bad weather. We've got things, those of you familiar with it, it's Salt End Chemical Park, and up in Teesside we've got Wilton International. And they're very, very rare because they're actually connected to offshore wind. So Dogger Bank, which is 2.5 gigawatts, those HVDC cables from Dogger Bank land. One of them lands in the middle of Wilton, the other one lands just north of Salt End. So we can genuinely say, chemical park, bad weather, meaning offshore wind, we can have hydroelectric power into producing metal. So super low embedded carbon into our metal. Hydro on site on the mine, offshore wind in the UK. That's our competitive advantage. Um, as I mentioned, we're extremely lucky. We've got fantastic shareholders, not least of which um, FSDA, that's the Angolan Sovereign Wealth Fund. This is great. This is a country saying we want to develop the resources in our country to employ lots of people to add value. We've gone as far down creating value in Angola as we can. It's absolutely fantastic. And then on top of that, we're working with a couple of multilaterals. Um, these are African banks and multilateral agencies who want to put their money into developing uh, projects in Africa. And it's going to be great for Angola that the money is going into the country and actually developing jobs. And the, the history of this is the Angolan Sovereign Wealth Fund did an awful lot of investment outside Angola, not actually. So this is a Sovereign Wealth Fund investing in the country. Just briefly on the economics, um, we can look at this later, but obviously we're a hundred million pound company sitting on an asset even at the base case, on the lowest numbers, a $600 million uh, uh, net present value, and a pretty good, the, actually our payback rate's faster than that, and a pretty good IRR. So we kind of look at the bottom of the cycle, look at the base case, and see where this works. Obviously the upside is much bigger, but the base case works, which is why we're able to finance it now. Um, strong board. Um, 
some of these people might be known to you. Uh, Jeremy Beaton, Jeremy's, uh, uh, Jeremy built the London Olympics um, and he delivered on time. Baroness Northover is uh, um, head of the all-party parliamentary group on ESG and critical minerals. Um, Steve Sharp sits on the EIT, European Union uh, Raw Materials Trust. So a proper independent board um, with considerable experience. And if I could just share this thought with you is that there's lots of rare earth companies in the world. Um, outside China, there's actually only two that are in production. That's Linus and MP Materials. Linus is an Australian company listed on the ASX, and MP is listed on the New York Stock Exchange. These two have market caps around three billion, three to four billion. The rest of the, the rare earth developers, unless you're more than 100,000 ton, tons of reserve or resource, very few achieve getting into production, just too small. Of those that have that, none of them have actually crossed the threshold into the space where Pensana has to actually have the finance. So we're big enough, we got the finance, and we're on that trajectory to be like a Linus or an MP. So I guess in summary is, this energy transition is not going away, it's huge, it's real, it needs enormous amounts of the demands for the product we can produce and the price forecasts are off the scale. They, um, every time you look at somebody, the price forecast is multiples of where we are. For a UK investor, there's loads of rare earth companies around the world, but only one or two listed on LSE, and that's us. And we are, as I'm saying, we've got the right size and we've got the funding. And I guess the key to it is we're coming to market, so to speak. We've only just started telling this story now because we're funded. We're not coming to you and saying, we've got this great idea, give us some money, we need to raise some money. We're coming to you and saying, we're funded. And um, we can unlock this value, we hope, start unlocking this over the next 12 to 18 months. If I can share one thought with you, and it may be a parallel, and maybe you guys have participated in it, but the uranium ministry is quite similar to rare earth. Uranium's a lot bigger, but quite similar. The uranium price sat in doldrums for a long period of time, and then suddenly over a three to six month period, it took off. And the companies that were exposed to that were the ones that were closest to production. So there's a company, uh, Boss Energy in Australia, went up 22 times on the back of the, rare, of the uh, uranium price doubling or trebling. So we're, I'm unashamedly saying to you, we're incredibly excited because if the rare earth price takes off, which everybody says it's going to, then we are in perfect position to benefit from that. Thank you very much for your time. Happy to take any questions. Please.